tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The panic of being renovicted is settling for less. As the Prime Minister promises a new renter's bill of rights, renters in BC want to see more details. Plus... We are feeling unsafety to do business. Unsafety, it's not safety, and we, we get scared. A family business in Surrey suffers massive losses after a stunning break-in at a mall. It looks like the numbers are in fact increasing. The number of calves that were conceived and born this year were higher than in past years. And scientists declare a mass die-off of gray whales in the Pacific Ocean over. But what caused it in the first place? This is CBC Vancouver News. Hello, I'm Dan Burr. Thanks for joining us. Renters in B.C. say they want to see more details from the Prime Minister's pledge of a federal renter's bill of rights. As Michelle Gomez shows us, the call comes as many people struggle to find rental housing and afford it in B.C.'s tight market. Justin Trudeau is promising funding to protect tenants against rent eviction and landlord abuse and requirements for landlords to disclose an apartment's pricing history. Nearly two-thirds of young Canadians rent their homes and they spend a greater share of their income on housing than other generations. And in cities like Vancouver, where we are today, this is even more true. This is the most expensive city to rent in in the country. A UBC study published last year found BC is the eviction capital of Canada, with an eviction rate of almost double the national average. Fiona Scott has been evicted from three different homes over the last 15 years, all for reasons out of her control. Most recently, she was rent evicted from her Kitsilano apartment in 2021, a place she had called home for seven years. When you're forced to be in a situation where your impending rent is proportionally more than what you've been paying for the last few years, um, through no choice of our own, it's it's hard. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a panic mode. She hopes Ottawa's new measures will protect those in similar situations. Even if it just allows the rental uh, rentee um, to have a little bit more time to find out their you know, stance and what, what, how they're protected um, because the, the panic of being rent evicted is settling for less. The Liberals are also proposing to change federal rules so that making rental payments on time could count towards your credit score to help renters one day buy a house. BC's housing minister says it's a small step in the right direction. The idea that someone can use their rental history as part of their credit score, I think it will help a lot of people. As for the Bill of Rights, we'll have to wait for the details. Many of the things that are being suggested are actually things that we've already done here in British Columbia. But many Vancouver renters say even with the new reforms, home ownership still feels out of reach. Vancouver or the lower mainland in general, it's really expensive to buy houses. And for me, I would have to win the lottery. That's the only way. Just the cost of living. You can't actually have a life and save enough money at the same time. It's, yeah, it's rough. The measures will be introduced as part of the upcoming federal budget slated to drop in mid-April. Michelle Gomez, CBC News, Vancouver. A Surrey family is in shock after their jewelry store was broken into this week. Thieves made off with up to $100,000 in goods. As Liam Britton reports, the costly heist was caught on camera. Four intruders enter and thousands of dollars of merchandise leave. Video provided by the family that owns White Rock Jewelers shows a devastating break-in early Monday morning. Owner Kong Nguyen says it only took minutes to lose about $100,000 of goods, and the store took physical damage that could add up to another 50 grand. Yeah, it's terrible. The first time we see that, they uh, broken all the window here. He says rings, bracelets, and pendants were swiped, and they were left with a huge mess. Broken the door, broken all the socket, and broken all the window. The family says the shop was uninsured. They say they've tried to get insurance, but companies have been too strict with their requirements. Nguyen says being robbed is a sad, frightening experience. 
we are feeling unsafety to do business. Unsafety, it's not safety, and we we get a scare. We get a scare. The shop is located here at Semiamu Shopping Center in South Surrey. Mounties say around 4.20 Monday morning, they were called about the break-in. They raced down with a dog team, but the suspects had fled, reportedly in a dark-colored SUV. Being able to review the video and see how calm they are and, and uh, they had a plan. They wouldn't say what steps they are taking in the investigation, but they are looking for any similarities to other crimes in other police jurisdictions. In this instance, it's a very brazen break and enter where the, uh, the suspects are clearly uh, just took their time and went about their business throughout there. Nguyen says he's been in the jewelry business about 10 years, but now he's thinking about how to run the shop differently. We have a gold, we have a diamond for sale, but we cannot put outside. But we, we still stuck to don't know how to figure out with that. Police are seeking any witnesses or camera footage to help solve the crime. Liam Britton, CBC News, Vancouver. The RCMP says officers have seized guns, ammunition and explosives from a home in Port Alberni. Now, do you say they went to the home on one Monday for a wellness check when they found restricted firearms as well as ammo? Then they came back with a search warrant. They say they found more guns, thousands more rounds of ammunition, as well as homemade explosive devices and chemicals used to make them. Police say they've since detonated the explosives. A 48 year old man has been charged and remains in jail. Commuting will be a little bit more expensive for transit users this summer. The Transit Board has voted for a 2.3% fare increase across Metro Vancouver. Sharia Shatri tells us more on how much it will cost you and why. It's a 5 to 15 cent increase to the regular and discounted fares. Like hike is always hike, it's rice, right? It doesn't matter like 10 cents or $10. Maybe for like a casual person that maybe uses it a couple times a week, it wouldn't matter that much. But person, personally, if I use it every day, it definitely builds up the five, ten cents. Every day, every time I use this, uh, so it is a very big problem. Sometimes it makes sense because everything else is going up. But I guess if they're going to increase prices, they should actually increase services as well. Translink says it is adding additional services, dozens of new buses on the road and extending operating hours on some routes. Investment plan is a, is a short term plan to address some of the chronic overcrowding that we're seeing on our system and in parts of the regions. This will be the third year in a row that Translink has increased fares by 2.3%. And Carson Binda, with Canadian Taxpayers Federation, worries the fare increase will add even more pressure to families. This fare increase and these property tax hikes are coming at a really bad time for normal British Columbian families. We know that food banks across Metro Vancouver are seeing record-breaking demand right now. Rent, mortgage payments are all through the roof. He says TransLink should tighten their budget spending on executive salaries instead of putting the burden on taxpayers. When you're staring down a massive budgetary shortfall, executive compensation is an easy place to start. TransLink's investment plan also calls for a 4% fare hike next year, but Vancouver School Board trustee Susie Ma says it's the wrong direction. This is an affordability issue, right? And if you start increasing fares year by year by year, it just compounds itself in a city that's already, you know, deemed by many as being not affordable. Instead, she calls on TransLink and the provincial government to provide free transit to teens. But TransLink says it's looking at a $600 million annual deficit starting in 2026. So that is not on the agenda. This latest price increase comes into effect on July 1. Shaurya Chetri, CBC News, Vancouver. More BC parents could soon access affordable childcare. Ottawa says it will give BC nearly $70 million for new childcare spaces, while the province says it's adding 930 spaces this spring. We know parents who work longer hours or shift work, families in remote communities, or families with physical accessibility needs often struggle to find childcare that works for them. This brings the total number of childcare spaces in BC to 15,000. For parents and guardians, finding a spot in the $10 a day program means paying $200 a month per child, down from more than 1,000. 
Meanwhile, a new primary health care center is coming to Richmond. People who have non-threatening conditions that need to be addressed within 12 to 24 hours will be able to access the Richmond East UPCC. The Richmond East Urgent and Primary Care Center is opening April 2nd. It will treat burns, skin infections and children's illnesses. The province hopes it can ease the burden on hospital emergency rooms. A new truck stop in Surrey is giving more drivers a safe and con convenient place to rest. The area near the Portman Bridge along Highway 17 has long been used by drivers to park overnight. But the space was not officially designated for that and didn't have washrooms, among other things. Caroline Chen went to check out the new space. It's a huge space. There's at least room for 100, 100 uh, trucks. So there's 100 stalls here. I've heard today that there's only been seven trucks that have been here. It's still quite new. So probably in the next few days, the word will get out that more and more truckers will show up here and be able to use the facilities. I spoke earlier with the Minister of Transportation, Janelle State, about what the need was that the government saw for a space like this. We wanted to ensure that we created a very designated space that was for the purpose that it was constructed for. So we put in fencing, we have security guards there, we have gated access in and out. It really is intended for short duration commercial truck drivers as opposed to anyone else. And the measures that we put in place ensure that it can be used for the folks who desperately need to use that facility. So before this, Truck drivers didn't have a lot of options. There was a space over by the Nordell Way scale, but that only had 40 spots. So you saw a lot of truckers parking along the highway overnight, which isn't really super safe. It's pretty good for the highway drivers because when they come here overnight, they cannot park on the streets, right? Because they have a delivery in the morning and they have to park on the street, they get tickets. And this is the good thing uh, Surrey City has does. I want to show you what is available. and. You have to keep in mind, like, if you've got a big semi, you're not going very far, right? Like, you need to have spaces for you. So we're here in the bathroom, and again, it's brand new because only seven truckers have been here. But as you can see, there's a place for a shower and <laughs> facilities. So it's a big deal. And you might think, oh, well, you know, you can go anywhere. But again, if you have a semi truck, you're, you're not going very far. The ministry has said that there's a lot more room here so that if there is a major need and there's more trucks coming in, they do have the ability to expand. So. The CBC's Caroline Chan. So we know about tornadoes, but have you ever heard of snow nados? A woman riding a chairlift at Big White Ski Resort in Kelowna recently spotted one. We were just bopping around on a nice spring day. It was warm and slushy. And all of a sudden, this snownado appeared above us, up on the ridge rocket behind me here, this chairlift right behind me, and um, it was quite an impressive one. Indeed. Say says she's seen several snownados, even got hit by one while on a chairlift on an earlier ride. She says this one, though, was by far the biggest. Darius Madavi, what is a snownado? I know the name makes it sound like it's related to a mm. tornado, uh, but earlier this week we were talking about dust devils, mm -hmm. and uh, this is really the same phenomenon, but just over snow rather than dust or sand or anything like that. So again, the, uh, the, you have the, that heat from the sun coming down, warming the ground, and then that heat from the ground slowly warms up the air right above it, and that's really what's happening here. But instead of the ground being grass here, uh, it's actually snow. So the conditions here are a little bit more uh, difficult to achieve over uh, over um, uh, snow than over pavement or grass or anything like that uh, because the snow the temperature has to be just right. If you get it too warm, that snow is going to start to melt. You can't you don't have that powder for the uh, the the snow nado to pick up and carry uh, carry up and produce that really dramatic effect. But if the snow if it's too cold and you don't get quite the amount of warming from the sun that you need, it's just going to be frozen over on top. And then again, you don't get that powder lifting up. So that visual of that really massive snow nado is uh, really exciting because it's quite a a rare phenomenon, even rarer than dust devils, because earlier this week when we saw a dust devil uh, uh, coming up, the really dramatic part of that was just the sheer size of it, whereas in this case, just seeing a snownado at any point is very exciting, especially when it's the biggest one you've ever seen. Uh, speaking of exciting, last night we got a thunderstorm. It happened, yeah, you might have heard it, uh, 20 seconds of just thunder rumbling at around uh, 9 44 p.m. Mm -hmm. First there was a little bit of activity along the strait uh, in parts of uh, uh, just over uh, on the island and then that came over here to us. We got one strike and some big uh, thundering rumbling thunder and then a second strike just a few minutes later. So 
A little bit of excitement mm -hmm. for anybody from Ontario. Kind of felt a little bit more like home. Uh, but yes, I, the one thing I miss from Ontario is mm -hmm. those big thunderstorms. Mm -hmm. uh, that was most of the excitement from last night. Beyond that, a little bit of precipitation continued in in parts of the province. But for the most part, we are calming down. And I'd expect a pretty sunny weekend. Okay, sounds good. We'll check in later. Thanks, hey. Darius. The rescue team working to coax a stranded baby killer whale from a lagoon off northern Vancouver Island is planning to change tactics to try to save its life. As of today, the next sort of attack could even be the case of getting a sling and physically sort of taking the calf out into deeper open water where they have a, a greater chance of uh, finding family. Uh, I'm optimistic just based on the fact that it often literally takes a village to raise some of these calves and the whale will have strong bonds with other family members if it can find them. The two-year-old calf has been swimming in the area since its mother died in the lagoon last Saturday. It's an at-risk Biggs killer whale. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans says the baby orca has only a few weeks to live if they can't rescue it. Still with whales, a mass die-off of gray whales in the Pacific has been declared over. And scientists have new insights into the reason why so many died off of this coast over the past few years. Michelle Gassoub explains the reasons behind the deaths and the signs the population could be bouncing back. Every year, gray whales make an epic journey from the Arctic to Mexico, a 17,000 kilometer swim around trip. But since 2018, these marine mammoths have been dying off, nearly 700 of them becoming stranded off the Pacific coast. Researchers say starvation may be to blame. They only have about five to six months of feeding to acquire all the energy that they need to go down and back. So if they leave the Arctic and the gas tank is not full, they're not making it back. There's nowhere to stop off to top up the reservoir. It's all or nothing. Gray whales have also died after being hit by vessels or facing attacks by the ocean's apex predator, killer whales. It's really dramatic to see how the killer whales can separate the calves from the mums. The mums will do their best to save their calves. But ultimately, it's very hard to save one's young when you have five, six, ten killer whales all there. Literally, it's like being attacked by Tyrannosaurus rex. But the researchers say all these factors are connected. A starving whale won't be able to fend off an attack from a predator or outswim a massive boat. A change in climate could be to blame. Because of climate change and the receding ice up there, it's thought that the nutrient value of some of the prey items has actually declined. And so there's a combination of increasing um, costs associated with having to forage in further and further away from their historic areas. This isn't the first unusual mortality event that scientists have recorded. There was another one back in the 80s and in the 90s. And there is some good news. On some level, the population does seem to be bouncing back. This mass die-off has now been declared over, offering a silver lining after years of loss. The numbers are in fact increasing. The number of calves that were conceived and born this year were higher than in past years. And the number of stranded individuals that are being reported is much lower than it has been even at the peak of the mortality event. Some hope the gray whales that travel the length of the West Coast may successfully make their migration again. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. Still with animals, a very friendly pig is looking for a forever home. The owner of a Prince George hog rescue says the pig was found alone on the side of Highway 97 last week. He needed help, and I just figured if, you know, we're contacted because of him, I just feel like that's his destiny. It's meant to be. He's a lovable guy. Yeah, we just don't want him to end up being anybody's food. He yeah. deserves a life. He ended up, he ended up with us for a reason. Mm. The porker hasn't been named yet, but he's about 125 pounds right now, very large for his age, and he's estimated just about a year old. The rescue says they're screening people carefully to find a loving home that won't use him for food or for breeding. With Ramadan underway and Easter approaching, Palestinian Muslims and Christians hold on to their faith amid the devastation back home. After the break, how some in BC are coping. Stick around. Thanks for joining our commercial free live stream tonight. The Atlantic Vet College on Prince Edward Island is holding a very special retirement party. Over the years, the college used beagles to teach students basic techniques. 
That program is now ending, and seven beagles are being adopted. Have a look. I love him, and he's probably going to be a great dog in our family. It's Andre's retirement party, and he's a teaching beagle at ABC. And he is, and it's his, his day. We're adopting him fully today. They've been fostered out for the last year as we gradually move uh, away from using the teaching beagles here at ABC. And they are now um, having their official retirement day. Brett's been with us as a foster for about eight months, and so today he's coming home with us forever. <laughs> for the most part, it's gonna be students who are taking these dogs. And, and the students have built relationships with these dogs even when they were here and then when they were fostered out. And so this has been a natural process for them to uh, to go to these homes and, and it's absolutely great. Brett was actually my first beagle assignment here at ABC in first year so we go back a long time we went on daily walks together and he was working with me in my clinical skills lab in my first and second year and then I've been bringing him in for the labs this year as well and he finished his last one in March. We had these dogs primarily for teaching and the uh, the, the concern was that we didn't want to have uh, dogs that were coming in from the public uh, being used immediately for teaching especially in the early years of the program. I actually work here down in the teaching hospital I'm a technician and I just saw him one day and he stole my heart and I was like you're gonna be mine someday. Now nothing invasive was being done with these dogs uh, to any extent uh, just sort of basic techniques teaching the students those sorts of things but there was always this concern about and liability concerns with having dogs that weren't owned by the university uh, so now we've kind of gotten over those obstacles, figured out ways of, of doing this, and uh, now there just isn't a need to actually keep dogs with us anymore. It feels amazing. Um, everyone in this school like really deeply cares for these dogs. So uh, it's much better that we move towards the new model of actually having student-owned dogs, and in some cases other client-owned dogs, coming in for those uh, early year uh, teaching practices. My hope for the future of this program is that we do get to bring in these student animals. It's going to be the best to help us learn how to how to poke and prod in the safest way possible for both animals, their owners, and for the rest of the curriculum. We are now into the third week of Ramadan. Muslims around the world typically gather with friends and loved ones to celebrate and connect with their faith. This year is different, though, with many eyes focused on the war in Gaza. While the UN Security Council has voted to demand an immediate ceasefire until the end of Ramadan, thousands of people remain displaced and many are on the brink of starvation. Adil Iskander is an associate professor of global communication at SFU and the director of the Center for Comparative Muslim Studies. Thank you for joining us, Adil. Appreciate Thanks for having time. me, Dan. Appreciate it. So how has the war changed how uh, Palestinian Muslims are marking Ramadan right now? Well, for many Palestinian Muslims, especially those who are living in Gaza, it, their entire lives have been upended. Many of them have lost loved ones. They've been displaced. They're currently being starved of essential goods and starved literally in, in every sense of the word. So this is not Ramadan. It's not any regular day, in fact, let alone a month of supplication and meditation and worship. Uh, and for Palestinians around the world, there are about, and most people don't know this, but are about 15 million Palestinians in total. Mm -hmm. So many of them are currently in the diaspora, including many here in Canada. But for many of them, they're, they're, it's a very heavy-hearted uh, Ramadan. They're thinking about, about their loved ones and their relatives and their you know, countrymen and women uh, back home and what they're struggling with. So it's difficult to be celebratory. It's a very somber, very melancholy Ramadan this time for, for most Palestinians, but also for Muslims in general. What community efforts are you seeing here uh, in terms of yeah. any support that people in the diaspora mm -hmm. are offering? 
Well, there's tons of fundraising for Gaza across the board. I would say that most the uh, the break fast uh, the the fast breaking uh, meal is the iftar uh, that happens at sunset, uh, and most uh, iftars that I've seen around the city and across the country and globally have, in one way or another, been an attempt to fundraise to support humanitarian aid in Gaza. So we see that, in fact. We're going to have one at CCMS uh, at uh, mm -hmm. SFU in, in about an hour or so. Mm -hmm. So these these things are happening all the time across the board because everyone is trying to chip in. It's sort of all hands on deck, trying to support, trying to push, trying to change realities on the ground for Palestinians. Is there any comfort that Ramadan offers to those who are in this who are in this war that's been going on for now six months? Well, uh, in in in, a, in no small small measure, yes, it is, there is because for even though many of them have seen their entire lives, uh, as I said, upended, even the places of worship, uh, the the mosques, the churches, many of them have been destroyed in Gaza. Uh, but because of the Israeli bombardment. Uh, many of them, at least the very act of standing together side by side and praying, praying in the same direction facing Mecca, all of that is a, is a way of embodying unity and coming together at least to mourn their dead, but also to demonstrate their continuity and their ability to survive adversity. So it is definitely a moment of reflection, a way to, you know, um, uh, to wish their loved ones ease and transition to the afterlife, if you will, but also to continue living despite adversity. And I think that, at the very least, is comforting for the soul, but also helps them continue their day-to-day -day life. We also know Lent is coming to an end. Yes, of um, what about Christian Palestinians who may be, yeah. uh, who are caught up in the fighting? Well, so basically, uh, Palestinian Christians are also the first century Pal Christians. They are the descendants of Jesus and, and, uh, and the, the Christian community there. And so uh, they are too embroiled in this. There's the assumption that Palestinians are entirely Muslim, which of course they're not. Uh, some of their churches have been destroyed in Gaza. The Christian community in Palestine are also reeling from what's happening in Gaza and also in the West Bank, where their life uh, has become increasingly difficult with the encroachment of settler attacks and what have you. So for Christian uh, Palestinians, this is also a time of Lent where they are also fasting. So it's one of those unique moments where all Palestinians are fasting irrespective of their religious denominations and reflecting both on their struggles and also thinking about how to overcome these difficult times and looking to their deity, you know, if you will, because you know, they, they all believe, it. they're both monotheistic sort mm. of uh, traditions. Of the Abrahamic and, tradition. Absolutely. Yeah. So all of them are looking up to the heavens and hoping that, you know, maybe there is mercy uh, in the coming days for all of them. Adel Iskander, we appreciate your time and your perspective. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Dan. Appreciate it. Some Ontario schools are suing social media companies for what they say is the impact on the way children think and learn. More on the suit and who's under fire after this. One week old Thomas Butler is a picture of health and the apple of his parents' eyes. He's also the first baby born at the new obstetrics unit. My first one, the girl, she was born in Grand Falls. And my boy, he was born in Gander, thankfully. And then that's when they shut it down again. And they just opened up just in time for my third one. After almost two years of patients driving for hours for obstetric service, the long-promised, long-awaited unit opened last week. They were just anxiously waiting for somebody to come in and have a baby. One girl even predicted that someone was going to come in tonight with a boy. And uh, she was right. It's nearly an hour's drive to the hospital from Carmenville, where baby Thomas lives. Amber Sims says she was lucky she didn't have to drive to Grand Falls, Windsor, where the obstetrics unit was located. I would have been pretty nervous because I, I don't know if I would have made it. And it was snow covered on the roads when we did leave to go in. So I'm not really sure if we would have made it or not. But I'm glad I didn't have to drive two hours to Grand Falls to have a baby. I went on up to the unit and uh, they never even put me in a room. They just brought me straight down to the case room. And she said, I looked at your file. She said, you was only two hours when you had your last one. And at 5.57, I, uh, I had Thomas. Thomas's middle name, James, is also a shout out to the hospital's namesake. And it was a really great staff. They made me feel comfortable, so it was good. 
Sim says she is grateful to the staff of the obstetrics unit in Gander for making her feel so comfortable during the delivery of baby Thomas. But she's especially glad she didn't need to tack an extra one hour onto that middle of the night drive in order to make that delivery happen. Troy Turner, CBC News, Carmenville. Two days after a massive bridge collapsed in Baltimore, officials say the recovery effort has now turned into a salvage mission. Investigators say it will take time to figure out exactly why a container ship slammed into a concrete column holding up the span. More now from Chris Reyes. Investigators are back on the cargo ship today. They're interviewing the 21 crew members who are still on board, as well as the two pilots who were tasked with guiding the ship out of the port. Engineers will also be on deck. They're going to be looking at every aspect of this vessel, including the bridge remnants that are still on top of it. While they're on site, they're gathering evidence and materials, but not sharing any findings until a preliminary report, which is expected in two to four weeks. Thousands of people from multiple agencies are involved, not just in the investigation, but also the clearing of the wreckage and then the planned rebuilding of the bridge. Depending on all of that, thousands of jobs and the billions of dollars of value linked to the port of Baltimore. Maryland Governor Wes Moore vowing to get the job done. The best minds in the world are coming together to collect the information that we need to move forward with speed and safety in our response to this collapse. Government is working hand in hand with industry to investigate the area, to clear the wreck, and to move the ship. Leaders from across local and state and federal levels are gathering funds to rebuild this bridge. That long road ahead begins now, starting with the heavy equipment that's already on its way to Baltimore to start clearing the wreckage. It's believed that four bodies that are still missing are entangled in the debris of steel and concrete underwater. This is new video of the bridge moments before it collapsed. It appears that some of those construction workers got into their cars to try and escape. Yesterday, two men were pulled from the water still in a pickup truck. Today, we are thinking about the families of Dolian Castillo Cabrera and Maynard Suazo Sandoval who were recovered and identified yesterday. We pray for the family and the families of all of the victims of the Key Bridge collapse, and our hearts are with the families. The governor has now filed a request for $60 million from the federal government. It's going to take much more than that to clear the shipping lane and rebuild the bridge, a project that could take years. Chris Reyes, CBC News, Dundalk, Maryland. Four Ontario school boards are suing some of the biggest social media companies. As Deanna Sumanak Johnson explains, they allege products like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Snapchat are designed to rewire the way children think, behave, and learn, and not in a good way. It's a David versus Goliath battle, the first of its kind in Canada. 
four major school boards launching separate lawsuits against social media giants. Snapchat, TikTok and Meta asking for over $4 billion. They allege that these companies have knowingly and negligently disrupted and fundamentally changed the school learning and teaching climate by creating and sustaining prolific and or compulsive use of their products by students. We've just seen such a significant change in student behavior and student mental health and well-being that it is just incumbent upon us to speak up and we cannot wait any longer. The lawsuit comes at a time of high scrutiny of social media and its impact on the lives of kids and teens. It also comes on the heels of hundreds of similar legal proceedings launched by school districts in the U.S. Not all of these things will stick, but I think what's happening is governments, parents, school boards are trying lots of different things to, to make the student experience as they grow up better, right? So they're less distracted, they're more focused, and they're able to learn and participate in the world the way we want to. In a statement to CBC News, Snapchat spokesperson wrote, while we will always have more work to do, we feel good about the role Snapchat plays in helping close friends feel connected, happy and prepared as they face the many challenges of adolescence. Experts say it's questionable whether the school boards will receive $4 billion, but the lawsuit makes a powerful statement in and of itself. So far, it's a big hit with concerned parents. If they're not going to make voluntary changes, then maybe doing it through the courts is the most effective way. I think the evidence is showing that there's clear uh, relationships to anxiety, depression, with outcomes like self-harm and loneliness. Uh, I mean, I guess it's complicated why that happens, but it seems clear that there's a relationship there. And medical research backs up that claim. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. And still on this story, Thomas Dagler now looks at what research says about the impacts of social media on kids and what parents and guardians can do. With social media giants keeping their detailed algorithms secret, there's no way to fully gauge why platforms deliver certain content to certain users. But teens know full well, somehow, those apps keep them hooked. They are pretty addictive. I, I really couldn't say that they're not. Yes, very. Super. Yeah, yeah. It's super addictive. And it's no trivial habit. Study after study has examined the impact of social media on behavior, you can see it with Ontario's there. Western yeah. University even using brain imaging to research how all that screen time is shaping kids' minds. These neurochemical changes are, are the same as what we see in, in addiction. They don't really have the necessary um, brain machinery to be able to, to manage concert rewards. In other words, seeing those comments and seeking more likes can prove dangerous for teens, with more scrolling linked to aggression, depression, and anxiety. There's families of In Washington recently, as big tech bosses were grilled about harms to young users, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg rose to apologize to parents, but he insists. Overall, teens tell us that this is a positive part of their lives. As four Ontario school boards sue social media giants for billions, parents are being prompted to talk to their kids. If we're aware that, you know, when I watch this kind of content, I don't feel great about myself, we can intervene. You can change the algorithm. You can start searching out other content that's making you feel good. Trouble is, users can only do so much. The burden ultimately rests on technology companies, and we need laws and policies that are going to do that. There's a lot riding on what users see on those apps, with the social media industry said to be worth more than $150 billion. Ontario school boards are demanding a bit of that money to mitigate harms. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Securing childcare can be hard on many families. When a child lives with a disability, though, it can be even more so. The CBC's Selena Alders takes us to a look at the challenges faced by two mothers in Nova Scotia. Courtney Peddle is a single mom of two, juggling three different jobs to accommodate her son's schedule because she can't find a childcare centre that can meet his needs. Her son Hunter has autism and is nonverbal. Peddle says he's also a flight risk. I've had to try and find jobs that work around their school schedule just so I can try to make some sort of income because it's, I shouldn't have to be a stay-at-home mom. I want to work. 
She says her son has been turned away by multiple child care centers because of his disability. It's nobody's fault that their brain is wired the way it's wired, but society has decided that we can't accommodate them, or if we are going to accommodate them, they all have to go together in an institution one way. There are very few child care centers across the province that are fully inclusive and accessible, most of which are at capacity with an extensive wait list. A spokesperson for the Department of Education says the province is working towards a child care system where everyone is included, but plans for a strategy are still underway. We Care Developmental Center is one of the province's leading inclusive centers. It offers a variety of specialized services like physio, occupational and music therapies, but it has a wait list of over 500 families. It is very disheartening for them. Um, sometimes we hear that families, you know, one of the parents is having to stay home, so they're unable to return to work. You know, it really, in my years in working within the childcare sector, I've never witnessed such a desperate need for care. Sarah Mullins' eight-year-old son, Nash, has autism, ADHD, a learning delay, and kidney disease. He attended We Care until he aged out and started school. Honestly, if I could still send him there, I would. Um, they don't operate like an after-school program or anything. Um, but they were the definition of inclus inclusiveness. Like Hunter, Nash has also been turned away from multiple child care centers because staff didn't have the resources to give him the additional support. Some of these centers were even advertised as inclusive. You know, if these facilities are going to offer these services, it should be a legal requirement that they're inclusive to everybody. Despite three years of searching for a center that will welcome Nash, Mullins has given up. She's now looking for alternatives and will continue to advocate for her son. Selena Alders, CBC News, Halifax. The Sweet 16 is now underway in March Madness with the U.S.'s top college basketball teams edging closer to winning a national championship. But as Jamie Strachan explains, it's a Canadian who's stealing the show. Edie inside. For Zach Eady, the journey to becoming one of the most dominant college basketball players ever Singleton to the hoop. Edie with the rejection. has been uncommon, to say the least. Like, understanding of the game and everything and to now where the point I'm at now, um, it's, it's been everything I could have asked for. As a teenager, Edie was more of a baseball guy until he grew and grew and grew. He transferred to high school in Florida before coming to Purdue, where he didn't play that much his first two years. I mean, I don't know if college basketball has seen a guy like that. Edie comes back in. Then he exploded. In 2023, he was National Player of the Year, an award he is set to win again this year. He will leave Purdue as the school's all-time leading scorer. If they win a national championship, he'll go down as a legend. You know, I think that's kind of the next milestone. During this year's NCAA March Madness tournament, the seven-foot-four center has been a force, leading his team to the Sweet 16, where they'll be favorites against Gonzaga. I've been doing this a long, long, long time, and there's just we you just have never dealt with something like Zach. The journey for Zach Eady here to Little Caesars Arena has been really an unprecedented one. One that's been helped with the support of friends and family. I'm stunned every time he gets on the court. Edie's mother, Julia, moved to Purdue to be close to her son. It is one of those things you just don't want to miss a minute as a parent. You really can't because you don't, you can't take anything for granted. It's been great for me to just have someone in the stands who I know and who I recognize. And Purdue is like a family to me, but my real family is like, it's, it's my mom, and my dad, and my brother. On Edie's forearm, a tattoo of the postal code from the Toronto neighborhood he grew up in, a reminder of home and how far he has come. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Detroit. A deadly dive to the Titanic. The Fifth Estate has uncovered new details about the Titan submersible and its deep sea expedition that killed five people last year. Stick around. How is your holy going so far? Um, it's been wonderful planning the event because we're really grateful for the opportunity so that we can celebrate an Indian festival so away from home, like millions of miles away. 
and kind of create that sense of community with people. And I think we've got everything set. Now we're just waiting for the day off to have people and see all their smiling faces. Reet, that's a lot of organization that's taken place. Yes, it is. We have to work with UBC authorities, a lot of like police, ambulance, et cetera, just to make sure the event is safe and all our attendees have fun. Um, I think we've all seen photographs of what happens during Holi, how you have these just, I mean, these clouds of color and on people's faces and everywhere. All, um, just to, uh, d describe or just explain that to me, Reet, what, what the, what it actually is. So Holi is basically marking the end of a cold, harsh winter and Holi celebrates spring. So the bright colors are colors of spring where people are just enjoying with their family and friends, putting color and yeah, eating good food, dancing to music. And that's what we aim to recreate at uh, on Saturday. It really is a celebration. Um, and what is the meaning behind the, the, the colorful powders? Is that just the colors of spring essentially? Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Okay. And they're made from corn flour and rice flour. So completely natural and organic. Okay. Mm -hmm. I always wondered because it looks like paint pigment when you see it <laughs> flying and I was like, hey, does that wash out? That's <laughs> my question. Um, and, and so, Terth, what can people expect at the UBC event? Um, at the UBC event, they can expect a lot of fun, getting to meet new people, enjoying with their friends, um, a lot of color, wonderful music. This year, we've managed to get a really famous artist all the way from India called Ritwiz. He's famous for his hip hop and electronic type of music. And we'll be serving people with a glass of free thundai, which is um, a famous drink in India that's supposed to be drunk on the day of Holi, mm -hmm. and also a free packet of color. Okay, and and what is the thundai? What what is it actually? It, it's basically a a milk preparation with uh, saffron, um, pistachios, cashew nuts, like a holy mix of all the nuts in it. Oh, that sounds sounds yeah. fantastic. Um, and and uh, Reet, there's a there's a note by the way that the dye is not going to be thrown; it's going to be smeared. Is that right? And uh, what's, yes. What's behind that? I think they're just being concerned of the dye being flammable. It's really not. It's it works and it's hot. It works when it's hot. Um, that but we don't have hot weather. We're expecting rain actually on the day of. <laughs> so yeah, that's it's just a security thing, just as a backup. But yeah. Is it, in India, is the dye flammable? No. Oh, not at all. This in fact, in India, we throw the dye as much yeah, I've around seen it. people and like in the air. And India is way hotter, so never have we had such a case. Okay. Yeah. What's, the, what's the meaning of smearing dye on, on, on somebody else? Um, it's just about celebrating the victory of good over evil, uh -huh. as the significance of the festival is. So it's about celebrating that happiness, being with your own people, putting color on them, showing some affection and love. We're sharing really important information with the public, and I feel like this is exactly what our job is, especially as the public broadcaster, especially in morning radio. That's incredibly important. So I know when I really like a song, if within the first three seconds, I'm already vibing to it. Hey, I'm Rohith Joseph. Vibin' is the new show all about discovering great new songs and fresh artists from across BC and beyond. It's not one person dictating what good music is, it's the community sharing what good music is. Stream Vibin' on CBC Listen. Time for our BC Wide Weather Forecast with Darius Madavi, Science and Climate Specialist. Long weekend coming up for people marking Easter. What do they get? Oh, well, lots of sun. Doesn't seem like it here. Still lots of showers, flurries coming to many places. Uh, those freezing levels are still a little bit low right now. Uh, they are still starting to come up, and by the end of this weekend, they're going to hit 3,000 meters, so definitely no snow coming anytime soon, uh, except for what we're getting right now and into tomorrow morning. So a little bit of a last dump for those mountains for the next little while, uh, but those showers are going to taper off into tomorrow morning for the lower mainland and, the, uh, and Vancouver Island. Uh, we're looking at those showers ending around noon tomorrow at the latest, uh, maybe a tiny bit continuing into tomorrow afternoon, but for the most part, we're going to be dry. If we take a look at our temperatures, this is probably where people are interested. Uh, we're going to see those continue to come up through the weekend in the south and then really stay up into the beginning of next week. Uh, so for that holiday Monday, it's looking like uh, yesterday it was looking like it was going to be more cloudy, but 
we kept our fingers crossed and it does seem like the sun will be out once again. So a little bit of good news there, some mixed skies on Monday, uh, but for Saturday and Sunday, nothing but sunshine and lots of sun tomorrow afternoon once those showers pass. Uh, you can see here in our forecast, not really much happening across the province at all, other than tonight when that, those last showers clear up. A little bit happening in the southeast still into the weekend and maybe the northwest as well, but for the most part, we are pretty clear. Uh, if we take a look at our conditions for tomorrow, still looks like a lot of activity here in the south, although this, the, uh, the more northern parts of the province already get their sun, but this is all just really mixed skies and those small showers in the morning, maybe lingering again a little bit longer in the southeast. And to take a look at that, let's look at our accumulations. You can see uh, there's still some snow coming tonight and rain tomorrow, but after that, other than in the northwest, that's really all we're going to get. So by tomorrow at noon, pretty much all the precipitation has passed, and we really just get that clearing up for sunny skies as that ridge of high pressure builds in from the north. So here on the south coast, not really anything significant still coming, but a good few millimeters still going to fall tonight. And here in Vancouver, again, not looking at too much, not, nothing really significant. Uh, but for a five-day forecast, we're going to see those clouds clearing up. We're going to see those morning showers tomorrow, and then nothing but sunny skies and some nice warm temperatures, Dan. So hide your Easter eggs outside. There Although our director did say he would come find them and eat them. So be well, careful. Because he's hiding them already. <laughs> so, you know, way to go. <laughs> Thanks. Well, an investigation by the Fifth Estate has uncovered new details about the Titan submersible and its deep-sea expedition to the Titanic that killed five people last spring. We now know multiple warnings were issued about the sub's critical design flaws. Mark Kelly now with why those serious issues may have been ignored. It was 2023, and the Titan submersible had become a bit of a fixture in St. John's Harbor. Check it out. Got a lot of people working on the submarine. This is YouTuber Jake Kohler preparing to leave port bound for the Titanic. But in Kohler's words, everything went wrong on the trip, including a failure of the sub's computer system. We've got to find out what this control problem is. That's sort of important, controlling the sub. It's up there with life support. The trip was called off, and this was just two weeks before Titan would implode. But this wasn't the first warning. There were troubles with the submersible. The Fifth Estate obtained this safety report written by OceanGate's own Director of Marine Operations. In 2018, David Lockridge outlined more than two dozen design flaws with the sub, including that experimental carbon fiber hull that deteriorated with every dive. His boss, Stockton Rush, fired him the next day. Rush assured people he had partnered with Boeing, NASA and the University of Washington to design the hull. When contacted by the Fifth Estate, all denied they had built, designed or tested the sub. Canadian Will Conan, who builds subs in California, warned Rush in 2018 in an open letter his expeditions to the Titanic could end in tragedy. So do you, do you believe that he was regularly misrepresenting the safety of the Titan? Oh, sure he was. So why did no maritime safety agencies in St. John's question the seaworthiness of the sub as it traveled in and out of the harbor with paying passengers for three years. The St. John's Port Authority told us they watched the Titan come and go, but said it was Transport Canada's job to inspect it. Transport Canada told us because it was a U.S. flagged vessel, it was up to U.S. authorities. But the Fifth Estate determined the Titan was never flagged in the U.S. I think it was General MacArthur said, you remembered for the rules you break. And, you know, I've broken some rules to make this. I think I've broken them with, with logic and good engineering behind me, the carbon fiber and titanium. There's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. Was Transport Canada aware of all the warnings about Titan? The agency declined our interview request, citing the ongoing investigation by the Transportation Safety Board. Mark Kelly, CBC News, St. John's. Ninety six hours airs tomorrow on the fifth estate at six PM local time here on CBC television, and you can watch it on CBC Gym. Still ahead, astronaut Jeremy Hansen is set to make history when he becomes the first Canadian to venture to the moon next year. More on his upcoming mission and what led him to become a space explorer after this.
get second chance If I break that we'll make it okay There's always some reason To feel not good And it's hard at the end of the day I need some distraction Let me be empty Oh, away this then maybe I'll find some peace tonight In the arms of you Fly away from here When this dark Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On April 13th, join CBC at the Vancouver Vasaki Festival. Drop by the CBC Vancouver tent, say hi, and win some fun CBC prizes. The Vasaki Festival continues in Surrey on April 20th. The event features some of the biggest celebrations outside India with colorful floats, community performers, and live music all rich in culture. More info at cbc.ca slash bc. Astronaut Jeremy Hansen is on track to become the first Canadian to travel to the moon next year. Speaking on BC Today with Michelle Elliott, Hansen says his passion for space exploration goes back to his childhood on a farm in Ontario. What I do remember is being just surprised the fact that humans left Earth and left boot prints on the moon. And when I would look at the moon in the night sky, I realized people had been there. And that was extraordinary to me. And I think it just opened up what was possible. Hansen will be taking flight on board the NASA Artemis II mission departing around September 2025. This mission will be landing on the moon, just flying around it and back, as if that wasn't cool enough. But the plan is to use this as a test run to eventually step foot on the lunar surface again for the first time in more than half a century. Long time. We are now in the final week of spring break. Perhaps you're hearing parents and guardians breathing a sigh of relief. Students will be back in classrooms after this Easter weekend. The break has put on an extra load on parents and gardens trying to juggle kids and work if they didn't have the time off. We talked with a few parents about how they're feeling. So how is spring break going for you so far? It's been long, <laughs> really long. 
<laughs> and are you ready for the kids to get back? I am, I really am. Are you feeling pretty tired? I'm a mother of three, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I work part time and we stayed local, so I am ready for kids to go back to school. <laughs> but it's nice to have a break in like the, um, the schedule. Do you know what? I think that we're lacking in um, community programs and that is a funding issue and it's a challenge. I would say more just activities. There isn't a lot that I've noticed is around and like they do have like day camps and stuff like that but it's really hard for me working full time to go to and from at the allotted times that they need to be there and like for pickups and drop offs it's just it's too much. I'd love to see like more funded programming for day activities or things like that. Um, but overall, maybe like a cut in some of the admission fees in some of these places that we love to go would be really lovely too. Science World, always a big hit with the kids. Done that with niece and nephew before. Good place to go. Not just kids. No, that's true. Science. <laughs> Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. You can watch this newscast on CBC GM, our free app, as well as on YouTube and our website, cbc.ca. We'll have your next local news at 11 o'clock right after the National. Have a good night.